You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. Hey, folks, what's going on? I hope it's good in your neck of the woods. I'll try to keep this short and sweet because you've got a great episode ahead of you and I don't want to take up too much of your time. But if you're enjoying this podcast, please, please share it with a friend. Tell somebody you care about. I know you hear every podcaster that you possibly listen to saying these things, but it's true. We need you. We couldn't do this without you. Quite literally, simply by downloading this, you have helped me out. But if you would like to help me out a little bit further, share this with a friend, and it would honestly mean the world. In fact, you can consider it my birthday present, because the day this episode drops, August 3rd, it's my birthday. Today is my birthday, or at least the day that you're hearing this is my birthday I'm recording this today before my birthday. Do you really care about my birthday? Probably not all that much, and I wouldn't blame you for it. But if you want to give me a little present, if you could throw me a new review on whatever platform you listen to this on, if you could share this with a friend, if you could interact with the podcast somehow, I would be so grateful for that. So thank you very much. All right, that's enough of an intro for now. You know how you can support me through the... uh, ToneMob.com slash Reverb and ToneMob.com slash Sweetwater Links and all that jazz. Join the ToneMob Facebook group. Blah, blah, blah. That's enough plugging for now. I don't want to plug anymore. I've done too much. Let's get into this wonderful episode with Mr. Ian Fowles from the Aquabats. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have Ian Fowles from the Aquabats. What's going on, man? Yeah, what's up? Dude, I'm pumped about this. This me is going to be fun. Thanks for having me. Of course. I can't believe that I know we've like talked back and forth in various capacities on the gram for like like four years or something. <laughs> I don't know why this has taken so long. I was like, one day, I was just like, why have I never like messaged him and asked him to do the podcast? This doesn't yeah. make any sense. You never asked. You never asked. I, I never asked. It didn't make any sense. This is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. <laughs> Maybe I should ask Ludicrous to come on. I wonder what he would say. He'd be hmm. down. You think Ludo would be down? You think Ludo, oh, Ludo yeah. plays? He, yeah, he knows how he knows how to get those tones. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, you know. I think pretty much most of the people that listen to this show are probably in some capacity familiar with the Aquabats. But to be perfectly honest, I don't really know the whole story of the band and your involvement. So I don't know if you want to start from the early days when you first started picking up a guitar and we'll just roll with that story and see what happens. What do you think? Uh, Sure. Yeah, we can start wherever. Let's do that. All right. Yeah, I mean, I started playing... Oh man, about 91 or 92, I was like 12 or 13. And um, uh, I'd always kind of wanted to play guitar. I, my dad had a great record collection and he'd just put on, you know, Zeppelin or The Doors or Cream or Cars. And we'd, you know, me and my sister would run around dancing to it. I'd pick up a tennis racket or an umbrella or something and jump off the stairs and pretend I was playing guitar, you know. It was. It was kind of that, and also um, seeing Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future do that that thing at the dance at the end. Because oh yeah, <laughs> I was a little kid, you know, I hadn't seen uh, you know MTV really yet or any of the the rock moves he was like ripping off really, and I you know I thought that was awesome. So so yeah, I'd wanted to play for a while, but my parents were kind of like, oh, why don't you try a, a band instrument in in school? And I was like, okay, and tried you know clarinet and cello and, and they were i just couldn't stick with them i didn't like them at all 
Um, and so finally, like, I guess, okay, fine. He, he really wants to play guitar. And my grandma bought me like a little nylon string acoustic. And they're like, well, I really wanted to play electric guitar, but they're like, well, here's an acoustic. We'll see if you stick with it kind of thing, you know? And so played the acoustic for a year, basically just never left my side, you know, I ate with it, slept with it, took it to the bathroom. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> you know, I loved it. I was glued to it. And so, okay, we should get him an electric kind of thing. So, so pretty much as soon as I got an electric, it was just like, all right, let's do this. I, I want to start playing. I forced some friends of mine to start a band with me and <laughs> I had a good friend. I'm like, you're playing drums, so you better start learning. And <laughs> one of those kind of things. And this all sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a very similar story, even oh, with nice. the acoustic guitar. Like, why don't you start with an acoustic guitar? I'm like, yeah, but I want to play like metal. So yeah, this is going to be difficult to do with this, <laughs> but I did the same thing. I like, like, I'm like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll stick with the acoustic. And eventually the electric came around. So I get it. Yeah. And you know what? It, I don't, maybe I was better for it. I don't know. But, you know, switching over to electric, it, it did feel a little easier to play after playing kind of that wide necked acoustic, you know, and, and stuff. So maybe there's something to be said for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's basically as soon as I got an electric, uh, I was, was playing live, you know, I kind of forced, like I said, forced some buddies to start a band with me and we, you know, we played our like junior high end of the year, like play day thing. I was like 13 or something, you know, and <laughs> I can't believe the junior high like let us play. We were playing like Black Sabbath and Aussie covers. <laughs> yeah. and, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they put out like a, a pallet as a stage for us to stand on. But, I, you know, in, we didn't really have a singer, but I, I sang one song. I sang um, War Pigs by Black Sabbath because the guitar wasn't really playing at the same time. So you could, it was an easy one to sing, you know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> But the That's rest were just kind of in instrumental covers of like Crazy Train and, and different stuff that I was into. So maybe some Metallica in there too. So um, yeah. Almost certainly. Um, there was almost certainly Metallica at that time frame, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, yeah, that was it. I was, I was off. And then, you know, when I got into high school, it just was so cool because there's so many other people that played instruments. And so it was, it was just on, you know, just meeting new people and starting new bands and, I, you know, I was playing sh like shows at little, little coffee shops and venues and stuff where like, you know, I couldn't even drive yet, but I hitch a ride or my parents dropped me off or something. And just, so, it, it, you know, it was just automatic almost, you know, I, I picked it up and it like, this was just natural and I just rolled with it. So like, at what point were you like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I am. I'm going to be a guitar player in a rock band. I think f like from the very beginning, it was all I thought about, you know, I would just <laughs> sit in class and doodle like uh, stage plots and pictures of like what it would look like on stage, you know, in the future, like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have this kind of amp and uh, you know, this, this drummer is going to have this kind of drum set and I'd be drawing out band logos and different things. It was pretty much, all consuming, you know, it's all I thought about. And it's all I did. Eat, go to school, come home, play guitar all night till I went to bed, you know? So I, I mean, I, so, I guess I didn't th really think it through logically, but I just like, this is what I really want to do if I could kind of thing, you know? So I guess living where I did, it, I had a lot more opportunity maybe than some other places in the country or world to, to get an early head start on it, you know? So, it, you know, it's at 17, I was, you know, already kind of touring, playing shows up and down the West coast and opening. Where are you from? Of, what, what I'm from what, Orange County, California. Oh yeah. You would, you do have a little more access to things being from Orange County. Yeah. I mean, sure. sh short drive to LA and, you know, just <clears throat> that, that kind of, um, being in bands is just kind of in the water there, you know? And I got, I had to, you don't realize it when you're in it, but looking back, you can kind of realize it's kind of crazy. And the high school I went to in Anaheim, Esperanza High School, you know, there's been a lot of professional musicians come out of that around the time I was in high school. Um, a band called Atreyu, kind of a 
metalcore band. Oh yeah, I love that band. Came out of there. Um, the Cold War Kids. Uh, two guys went to my high school, and then the band I had started, uh, Death by Stereo. Uh, from there, so I mean, there's, there's others too. It's just it was like a just a time and a place where um, you know there's a, just a lot of music happening. There's a lot of places to play locally and. Even if you were kind of a kid, you know, you could still play them. It's interesting how, you know, in certain places and times that happens. So, like, no, there weren't any real serious bands that came out of my high school. We were, like, this, you know, suburban, you know, like, suburb of Portland, basically. But it was weird that we had enough bands in the school to have a high school battle of the bands with only people from our school. So, there was, yeah. like... I don't remember, maybe like seven bands or so, seven or eight bands that they were able to like fill out a legit bill. And like, you know, not everybody was good and we definitely weren't good, but it was uh, it was just interesting that like there in this pocket of time, there were, you know, this was like the early, two, the early mid 2000s. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, we had a, a really decent like screamo band. Like they were really good, and like we did okay for we were like definitely like the most punk rock sounding one uh, with our Dropkick Murphys covers and stuff. But it was yeah. just a nice, a weird, a weird time. But like you guys really hit it. You had like legit bands coming out of your school. Death by Stereo. I I actually didn't know that you started that band until recently, and I was like, wait a minute, I I listened to those guys quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you were with the band when I. When I saw the band, were you always with Death by Stereo? No, I, I started that band um, like 97 or so. Um, and yeah, around 97. I was only in it a couple years before I quit. Um, so I basically like, you know, formed the band, kind of named it, wrote most of the songs and re recorded some demos in a seven inch and some stuff and then quit before they did their first full length. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I did some shows up and down the West coast, but no full tours with them. But, um, you know, you know, being thinking about it in the mid nineties in orange County, I think there was a, a thing of like, you look around and it definitely seemed possible to, uh, be in a band because everyone around there was, I mean, it was getting signed kind of, there was, um, you know, uh, the whole Green Day and Offspring thing happened, right? And Offspring was from Orange County and then no doubt had that number one record for a year or two, whatever. Um, and so there was a lot of bands around there, um, you know, uh, kind of getting big. And so I guess it just seemed like, oh, this is natural. Sure. Yeah. You just start, start a band and, and, you, and Sublime and, and trying to think of others as, you know, definitely others I'm missing. Um, but it just seemed very possible to just be in a band and, and, uh, tour and, and make music on a big scale, you know? It kind of is a, an interesting thing when you see that there's, there's a way, uh, that sort of happened with me in a little bit different sense when, when podcasting started to become more popular, I was like, well, I think I could do that. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. I could, I could talk to people about guitar stuff and there wasn't, really anybody else doing it at the time that I knew of anyway, not in the interview format at least. And so I was just like, well, I found this app that we're using right now. And I was like, well, I guess let's, let's give it a try. And you know, there's a lot to be said about what you were explaining, like just knowing that it's possible. I'm not trying to compare myself to no doubt by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a, uh, it's just, it gives you that spark. You're like, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is a viable way to make a living versus never having anybody that you were remotely familiar with having done anything like that before. It's a different thing. Yeah. So when did you start this podcast? Uh, 2015 is when I started. So it was definitely not like a pioneer <laughs> by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. <clears throat> but anyway... So but yeah, I mean, if you see someone already tread that path, who's nearby, you know, it becomes, and there's just, there was just a big scene there. Even a lot of like mid-level bands, uh, you know, kind of 
bands that would turn into like warp tour staples and stuff, you know, and just other bands, um, that kind of from the eighties punk bands, like agent orange and social distortion and the adolescence, you know, DI, all those bands, a lot of them kind of resurged in the nineties after the whole punk thing kind of came back into the mainstream, you know? So yeah, it was, just, there was just a lot of opportunities there. Uh, looking back, thinking about it, it was, it was kind of crazy. Just a lot of places to play and just a, kind of a, a lot bubbling up at the surface, you know? I felt pretty lucky now looking back to having lived through that and seen a lot of cool bands and played a lot of cool shows there. What do you think was the cause for that resurgence? Like in my mind, it's like, well, probably Nirvana, but that can't be the only thing. Um, Nirvana, maybe a little, but I really think it was more... Uh, Green Day and the Offspring, that Dookie record and Smash right. by Offspring, those kind of came out a few years after, you know, Nirvana and a, and right as, right around when Kurt died, right. So, not the grunge was over; it wasn't over yet. But um, he died. What was it? Ninety four. I think so. And that Dookie record came out like ninety four, right, or ninety five? I think I think that's correct. I think ninety four is when Dookie dropped. Yeah. So like grunge had kind of popped up, what, 90, 91? I guess Nevermind was 91, right? Yeah. So grunge kind of ruled the world for like three years or so. And it, obviously it continued. And that was a weird time because everyone claims like that was the end of, of hair metal, but it really wasn't yet. There's was still, you know, the Metallica Black album. It was huge. What was that 92 when it, or 91? Do you put that in the hair metal category? That almost seems like a different thing. Um, I, you know, I, I consider the Black Album pretty mainstream. I, you know, it's very mainstream, definitely. It's not as maybe, maybe not maybe not hair metal as far as like as kind of goofy as Poison or Rat or or some of that. But but people would listen to same fans of that would listen to all of it. Just guitar rock, guitar metal. You know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Heavy heavy metal. It was definitely. <laughs> And Metallica had kind of lost its its um, a lot of its you know scariness by the Black Album. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, I, if scariness is the right word, but like you listen to Master of Puppets, you're like, whoa, okay, they are serious. This is a heavy record, right? Mm -hmm. Black Album was a lot different, more blues based solos, more like pop song structures, and and they were you know they were going for it. There was a video for every song, you know, and then nothing else matters, right? You got to have, uh, in the early 90s, you got to have that ballad. <laughs> you got to. You just have to. <laughs> yeah. It, more than words or silent lucidity or, you know, what. <laughs> <laughs> to be with you. There's every shredder band had to have that ballad around that time. So there's that. But yeah, I mean, it was a convergence of all kinds of guitar music, right? In the early 90s. You got the, the kind of the last the last of the hair metal, heavy metal, you've got grunge coming in and then you've got the punk thing resurfacing right after that. Right. So. Yeah. What was it about the offspring record? There's some, there's a, it was a big deal. It was like the first indie label to sell a million copies or, or some, something like that. Do you remember what that, what that record was that it broke? I can't remember what it I was. I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, they, they were on epitaph records, I believe, which is an indie and, and maybe it was, yeah. I mean, that would make sense. I don't, I think, I don't really know for sure. I think that's it. There was some, there's some real reason why Smash was like super important as far as independent music goes. And I think it was the first one to sell a million records. If only there was a machine sitting in front of me where I could look this up. <laughs> Not just guess. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's what we do. We shoot from the hip around here. Yeah, and but then you have the like ran rancid outcome, the wolves in like '95. That was huge. Man, and I, I love that record on Epitaph as well, and No Effects's um, Punk and Drublick. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there was just a lot of bands just putting out some of their best stuff in the mid '90s punk bands, anyway. Yeah, definitely so, things that are kind of considered like milestones for the genre. You know, whether yeah. whether they're you know quote unquote punk enough for certain people is up for debate. But sure, I don't yeah. think any serious like. I don't know, connoisseur of that type of music would say that it wasn't a super important era. 
it's kind of impossible to ignore. Yeah, definitely. So when did the Aquabat stuff start happening for you? Well, um, I joined the band in 2006, like January 2006. They had been a band since like 94. Right. And, um, you know, they had done a few records already and Travis Barker was one of their drummers and he left to join Blink-182 um, and pretty much launched them into the stratosphere once he joined their band. <laughs> um, but yeah, the time I came around, their longtime guitar player, Corey, had been the band, you know, 10 years or so, was quitting. And so um, I just got a call out of the blue from Christian, the singer, I'm not even positive how he got my number. Um, I think through, <laughs> through a mutual friend, I think. And um, and they just called me like, hey, do you want to come down and kind of audition or play with us? And I'm like, yeah, of course. I had at that point been touring as like a hired gun in a few different um, kind of post-hardcore emo bands, a band called Sense Field and a band called Further Seems Forever. And uh, both of those were, were over and, and I had like, well, now what do I do? And I'd just right. gone <laughs> back to school and <clears throat> started a master's program. And then Aquabats called. And I'm like, well, I could probably do both. And uh, yeah, so <clears throat> they liked me. I liked them. We, and <clears throat> I, I joined them and um, I don't know. Where do we go from there? It's, uh you know, we started touring right away with them and it was the best group of dudes I've toured with, you know, it was, it got along super good. And, and then, um, there was always since the beginning, like, a a uh, a, a desire to make the Aquabats more than just a, just a band. They tried to make it an, a TV show kind of since the very beginning, they'd had some development deals with Fox and, Buena Vista, Disney, um, had never quite worked out. And then right about the time I joined, they had, they had just, um, shot a pilot for this kid's TV show called Yo Gabba Gabba. Oh, right, 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 right. And, uh, so that got picked up by Nickelodeon and, um, and then a couple years after that, we shot another, we shot a pilot, and like a revamped Aquabats TV show pilot around 2008. And then that got eventually picked up, uh, 2011. Yeah. So, um, who picked that so, one up? So, uh, it was a TV station called the hub, which is no longer around. They were a combination of like discovery, channel and hasbro toys okay and um they they did like a a lot of reruns of like kind of throwback uh you know stuff like gi joe's transformers uh the wonder years it was definitely like a, a family type channel and then they had some original programs like that new or my little ponies reboot um and a newer Transformers one, and then they um, they were looking for another new show, so they picked up the Aquabats show, and then we did a you know a few seasons of that, and then the, right then the TV show or the TV station folded around 2014. Gotcha, gotcha. But um, but all the the whole time still you know touring and and playing shows as a band. So I don't know if this is answering any of your questions. <laughs> well, no, it was just kind of like, I was, what I was really curious about, I know you weren't there for the beginning, but like the Aquabats is such a unique idea. You know, there's nobody else doing what you guys do. And yeah, I guess I I've, should probably like, I want, I'd like to know not, like what the process and the all, like all the nuts and bolts of the things. It's very interesting to me. 
I'm, I'm sure there's probably people listening here just think, oh, the Aquabats, just a normal band. Okay, they had a TV show. No, like Aquabats is a, it's, its own unique thing. They were like a superhero rock band. Like we dress up in costumes and fight superheroes. Uh, I mean, fight super villains and um, on stage. And it's a, a very kind of cartoonish band, right? And, um, uh, you know, the, um, it's really kind of the vision of this of the singer Christian Jacobs and and what he, his you know growing up as like a child actor in Hollywood and um, just kind of filtering a lot of the eighties kind of pop culture stuff into into a band right uh, mm-hmm. a lot of co- comic books and you know the sound is kind of you know started out punk and ska but it got some new wave flavor like devo and boingo kind of thrown in there as well it's kind of its own unique animal at this point but um yeah it's definitely just not like a normal band it's it's got a whole mythos that you can get into if you want with backstory behind all the characters and all the um the villains and the tv show just allowed us the ability to expand that universe right and and bring in new villains and new stories and and stuff so it was super fun making that tv show i don't know if you've seen it or not i I have not but i there are a lot of people in the facebook group who have uh the facebook group around this podcast so we'll get into some of their questions in a little bit but i think a good one to uh get into is um What's your character's backstory? I know we're not going to have the time to get into every character in the band, but you're the here. You're the one we're talking to. What is your character's backstory? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, my character is Eagle Bones Falcon Hawk. And uh, basically, uh, just kind of a, a lone guitar slinger wandering through the desert, come upon the Aquabats who who need some help. And... and um, I join up, join forces with them, and and I'm kind of like a headstrong, you know, soloist who just wants to be soloing all the time, and uh, <laughs> and then I, I have to learn how to how to um, you know find balance, and uh, I have a, a run in with the spirit of the sun who who grants me uh, the powers of second sight to see beyond the veil of reality and also gifts me with an invisible bird. And so, um, I kind of become the, uh, the shaman of the group, so to speak, the, wa- the warrior monk, you know, if you will, of the Aquabats. Well, this dives right into some of the questions we have. So this is perfect. <laughs> so oh, great. We have a rather large Aquabats fan in the group. His name's at Joshua Frazier, and uh, he has a couple questions. So uh, he said, <laughs> this goes right into your, your invisible bird. Okay. What, what's it like working with the dude? <laughs> yeah, the dude can be very temperamental. Um, she uh, she kind of comes and goes as she pleases and um, kind of does whatever she wants. Uh, you know, I even though she repeatedly helps us out of sticky situations, um, none of the other guys really believe that she exists. So, (laughs) um, it's hard to get them to, to believe me that that I actually have an invisible bird that I can summon to help us fight evil. They think you're a little, a little bit crazy, a little bit. Yeah. 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 (laughs) They just kind of, they, they kind of roll with it. Nothing phases us that much you know oh eagle bones and your invisible bird again whatever (laughs) Uh, i love that kind of stuff so a little bit more of a serious question he says when playing older aquabats tunes does do you do your own thing or do you try to match the previous guitarist parts um um it's a little of a mix of both I, i i try to play the parts as best I can from, you know, having just learned them by ear and from having learned them a little from the original players. But, um, I do do some things that are kind of my own just to bring it up to speed kind of with the way I play a little more. So 
you know, some of the early, early songs are kind of very third wave ska, kind of that inky, inky, inky upstroke kind of oh, yeah. stuff. Pick, and pick it up. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I kind of I change that to a little more kind of downstroke Ramones, Black Flag kind of strumming. So I will make some little tweaks here and there just to make the songs more powerful live, in my opinion. Um, gotcha. That makes sense. And and most of the time, I'm I'm the only guitar player, so sometimes I'll have to choose between parts because for a while they had two guitar players, and um, so it's a you know a choice of well, do I play kind of the more lead or more rhythm during this section? So I've just had to make executive decisions, you know, with the band on which parts sound best for for certain songs. So. Yeah, I mean, so I guess the answer is I kind of little little my own stuff mixed in with a little of the old stuff. Right. Little, it, it's hard little, when you when you come you come into a band that's been around. They were on like twelve years when I joined, and um, so I, you know I'm still the new guy. I still feel like the new guy, and that it's, it's still hard for it to feel totally like my my band. You know, even yeah. though now I've been in the band like fourteen years or something. I was going to say, um, even after all this time, it still doesn't quite feel like home. Yeah, well, yeah, in, in a way, because you know, I maybe there's something to be said for having been there s- since the beginning or early period, because think a thing is formed, right? And then you come in, and like that question is probably asking, like, do you just throw away the legacy or do you try to honor it? You know, so I try to honor it and then do stuff to push the boundaries a little too. So. Yeah, but it you know it still feels a little because their biggest records were before I was in the band, so um, you know it's you've got to try and please the fans who want to hear those songs like they were on that on those records, right? Right, 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 right. So it becomes a little it's just a balancing act for you, like right, right. So Joshua has one more question, and it was actually yeah. something I was going to ask earlier. Uh, he says, "I'm also really curious about the Aquabats writing process." Well, that's something that is just kind of very different and has changed all, even since I've been in the band. I don't know how they used to do it before I was in the band, but um, the Aquabats is such a it's such a uh, unique animal because I was what I was in the band five, four or five years before we put out an album mm-hmm. and, and we haven't put on an album since. So it'll be like nine years. We're putting out an album this year. It'll be nine years since our last album. So <laughs> it's not like we're cranking out an album every year or two, like most bands. Um, that being said, though, we did when we had that TV show, we did write quite a bit of music ourselves for the TV show, and we did put out a like a double LP of that music. I don't really count that as a as like a normal album, right? It was music for the episodes, and you know, not just oh, I, I wrote this song. It's like they were geared, like, hey, we need a song for this episode that kind of involves this, and so we had to write to that, but. So yeah, the Aquabats writing process um, yeah, happens just in a lot on, of different on your experience. That's all. Yeah, in a, yeah. In a lot of different ways. Like um, there'll be a thing where we'll, where we get together as a band, and someone has an idea, and we just jam on it and work it out. Um, since since the show, though, it's been more of a thing where someone will demo out something on Pro Tools, kind of email it around, and everyone kind of decides if they like it or not if they oh yeah this one's worth working on and you know it's pretty democratic we'll vote on different stuff and uh you know decide like oh this these are the kind of the the bet the ones that all of us like and then we choose like a batch and we'll work on those and we'll go into the studio and lately a lot a lot of the, the last record most of it happened in the studio right Mm-hmm. We had we had a skeleton, and then in the studio, it got really fleshed out. So, 
And then we've also had some of our friends who are outside writers, you know, hey, I've, I've got this idea. I'll, I'll throw it out to you guys. You like it? You know, uh, Warren Fitzgerald from the Vandals and um, sent us a couple songs that we used. And then um, our friend Matt Gorney, who was in a band called Bad Credit from San Diego, he did a ton of music on the Super Show, the TV show. And uh, he's got a couple songs on this new record too. So we're like, we've turned into more of like a, a collective in a way. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's this big... very, yeah, since the uh, uh, Yo Gabba and the Aquabats show, it's turned into like a kind of a very collaborative thing. That's a, I mean, that's really cool though. Like it's kind of become a community that helps get the project off the ground rather than just like a handful of, of dudes you know, doing the thing. And it's true because we're all, all of us in the band are kind of pulled in a lot of different ways. We all have multiple kids and um, the Aquabats doesn't always pay all the bills. So we all have other things going on on the side. So, you know, it's a matter of just, you know, how can we do this with the limited amount of time we have? So, you know. However, so, we can get it done. <laughs> <laughs> that this kind of ties nicely into your what you were just saying about having other projects. So, uh, Brigham Alcorn, he says, ask him about his book. He's like, I need to mail it to him to have him autograph my copy. But I didn't know you had a book. So, tell me about your book. Yeah, um, it was just a basically my master's thesis that I self published about, about ten years ago. And it's called A Sound Salvation, Rock and Roll as a Religion. And it was basically uh, just me trying to prove that rock and roll could fulfill all the criteria of a religion. So you go through the kind of the, the categories like the sacred texts, the music, the sacred um, spaces like the concert venue, the recording studio, the, um, the sacred beings like in gods and heroes, you know, you have, you know, Elvis and these rock stars who gain these larger than life, um, personas and become almost icons and, uh, the community that, 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 um, forms around a scene or a band or a, a type of music can become like a family to people. And, you know, it's, it's just me basically kind of showing the parallels and how, rock music uh, could uh, and it functions as religion in a lot of people's lives who a lot of people who don't have formal kind of religion r music is their religion yeah that's it's an devotion it's an interesting thought because you know most people not not everyone but almost everyone does end up becoming a part of some sort of community whether it's you know fans of a band or, you know, fans of a TV show or, you know, a bunch of gear nerds, you know, whatever the case right. may be. You do tend to like, especially with the internet these days, you tend to gravitate towards some sense of belonging and some sense of community. And I, I never really thought about rock music being a big community in a way, because it, it, it is. That's that's an interesting point. I never, never really yeah, thought I mean, about you could, that way. I mean, you could meet someone you've never met and, and you do this all the time, obviously, with podcasts, like you're able to talk for an hour, or I'm sure you could talk way longer on just shared experiences with gear, with with uh, concerts, with, you know, you know, stuff you have in common because you're a musician, because you've listened to music, because you've played music, right? So um, it can be kind of a de facto kind of family or, you know, spiritual community, you get your fellowship with uh, other people that way there's there's a ritual aspect to it too like you know attending a concert right when you when you go to a concert you're entering like a uh demarcated kind of sacred space the venue where you you leave your normal world behind and you enter this kind of liminal realm of um it's its own it's its own world with its own rules and there's the you know kind of the ritual dance or whatever goes on inside um, and you leave kind of refreshed and able to uh, return back to your normal life um, and able to deal with your normal life better having gone through that ritual, you know, kind of 
acted in a way in that sacred space you may not be able to act in everyday life kind of <laughs> let out whatever's inside you and and um you know be free from kind of the troubles that you, you go through in your normal life and i mean there's just mechanisms built into rock and roll to make it easy for this kind of deification to happen too you know their faces are on tv and movies and magazines and i guess that's sliding a little as of late but you know from the 60s till the 2000s um rock stars were very easy to idolize right oh for sure yeah the the whole social thing has kind of like broke that down a little bit and in some ways like the podcasts and other things like one thing that i've Re, I, you know, you always know these things, right? And I've said this a bunch of times on the show, so sorry for repeating this. But now that I'm getting to talk to people like you that I've listened to, for, you know, on and off through the years and other people that I like really have looked up to musically and have gotten to have some of them on the podcast, it's like, oh, it, it's just dudes like me. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So yeah. like a, that deification is definitely like, Tamp, you know, it's it's been tamped down a little bit, but I think that's the case with popular, uh, not just rock music in particular, but I think that's that's the case with pop culture across the board. Like, there's more access to people, you know, other than like Bill Murray. Uh, there's more <laughs> access to people than than ever. Like, people are revealing, people are having these type of conversations. People are going on podcasts and long form interviews and having long conversations, and you you come away with like, oh yeah, they're just a person trying to figure this out, like I am most of the time. And so it does kind of strip away some of that larger than life aspect to, to some people. Yeah. But also too, I, mean, I agree, uh, but also too, there's like MTV isn't kind of non-existent as it used to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's not really a centralized force for you to, to, to go to, right. There's a, now there's YouTube with, millions of different videos and it, there's just there's not the same kind of mass culture there used to be right so before the internet it was it was easier i think to have just a few big big stars right oh right 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 and now there's uh well now rock isn't even really in the mainstream anymore you know the it's just kind of pop and R and B artists that are get that same push, right? But um, how many? You know, there's not many rock bands kind of put up there on the national scale like like it used to be. So, right? Yeah, you're right. There's there's like a very democratic thing where it's leveled the playing field a little, bit and also maybe you're right stripped away some of that um, aura of the untouchable godlike star so yeah it's, it's weird <laughs> it's yeah. weird to have lived through the the period before the internet and then really kind of understanding how it's shaping things it's weird it's a weird thing to have witnessed happen right but also music i mean more than even like other things that you could look at religiously like like sports or or food or whatever, whatever someone gets obsessed with, right? Mm -hmm. There's something about music, I think, that is inherently like spiritual or at least, you know, beyond the senses a little bit, right? There's something mystical or magical about it because you'll, you'll listen to an album or a song or you'll go see a band and it touches you in a way um, that can only be described almost in religious terms, right? The feelings that you felt like, oh, the exhilaration or um, the emotion that you feel, you know, from a, from a certain artist or from a performance or from a song, it, you know, it feels like it speaks to your, not just your, your mind or your ears, but your soul, you know? For sure. I don't know if you've Absolutely. had that experience, but I think a lot of people have, and that's why they, that's why they play guitar. That's why they do what they do. That's why they go to concerts. That's why they, they, they love that, that feeling. So, oh yeah, many times. I mean, going to concerts is 
that's what that's what my wife and I do. You know, like some people, I don't know, they go hiking or they go, you know, boating or whatever. Like going to shows is like our thing. Like, okay, we leave the kids at grandma's. We're going to go see, you know, insert favorite artists here. And we have a lot of a lot of artists that we both really enjoy. So it's I miss it really bad. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait yeah. for it all to come back, man. It's it's right. Ugh. But I don't want to be. I don't want to get into that too much. But okay, it, <laughs> we can if you want. But I don't really want to either. I don't want to. There's enough other places where you can find out whatever you want to find out. But we should get into some gear stuff because supposedly this is a guitar podcast. <laughs> supposedly, yeah, of course. It rarely is anymore, but supposedly it's supposed to be. But uh, yeah, I'm actually kind of curious, like your gear over the years, like. When you started playing Sirius, what did your rig look like versus what it is now? Yeah. Well, when uh, starting out, I, I just wanted a Les Paul and a Marshall. That was that's what I wanted. You know, that's mm-hmm. the sound I wanted. Um, besides, you know, Jimmy Page and Slash and a lot of those people playing it. It's just I knew it's that's the components I needed to play kind of hardcore punk rock and make it sound the way I wanted it to sound. So, so that was it for me for many years was just a Les Paul through a Marshall and, um, and then started branching out and some other Gibsons. I had a flying V and SG always kind of had a strat around too. Mm -hmm. Um, but didn't use it much live in the bands I was playing in, you kind of, it was just dictated by the, the sound of the band I was playing in. So a lot of those, those bands early on were just heavy, heavier sounding bands with a really thick sound. Um, but when I joined the Aquabats, uh, the sound is very different. There's nowhere to be found a Marshall or a Gibson. So, um, uh, it's, that's really when I started, getting more into fenders because the aquabats you needed that kind of like surf guitar twang with yeah them. definitely and um so the uh amp when i first started playing with them i got was a it was a 68 fender basement head um with uh with a 212 upright late 60s cab so with, cool um, vintage 30s in it and uh and that that was the amp for me for for the aquabats because it could it could get that that uh, that push into into the overdrive but it wasn't so saturated it was heavy metal it was just some get some rock and gain out of it but you could also when you dial the pickups back a little you get that clean for kind of the surfy and ska parts so um that was kind of the the main amp when i when i started and and uh I've gone through different amps over the years, but that's been the main one um, live. And recently, I guess not that recently, five or six years ago, I added in a satellite Barracuda so mm. with another not, not another one of those upright 212 Fender cabs. So that's kind of been my main live rig uh, for a while is a satellite Barracuda and a Fender Bassman. And then as far as guitars, um, with the Aquabats, um, it started out, I was playing a Dean Cadillac, which you probably never heard anyone on this podcast talk about. <laughs> I have not. I'm not familiar with that at all. What is it? So my, my buddy worked at um, D-Drum, which was owned by Dean. And he's like, this is before I was in the Aquabats, like, I'm going to get you a guitar. I was like, all oh, right. I, I kind of like the Cadillac. He got me a left. See, I'm left-handed, so the, the guitar game is so very different for me. That is um, something I wanted to get into and was asked about. So yeah, it's yep. it's just so sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had always wanted a Fender Jazzmaster. I was just never able to find one um, until we got the TV show. We had a friend over at Squire, and and he's like, "Well, we'll see if we can make you a jazz master." I was like, "That would be amazing." So Squire made me a couple of jazz masters for the TV show, and um, and I fell in love. So 
I, I kind of always wanted a jazz master when I was a, a kid. I had bought an Elvis Costello record at a thrift store. When I was like 16 and he has that jazz master on the cover, the first first record, My Aim is True. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, that's such a cool guitar. And that's one of those things like I always kind of looked for and just never, never could find one. Or if I did see one, I didn't have the money at the time, you know, but they were so rare <clears throat> in the 90s and 2000s. Um, they were only made in Japan and they only made batches of them every so often, right? And they, when they'd come out, they'd get sold super fast. Right, of course. And then they wouldn't really resurface very often. Um, so it was just always always hard to, to try and find. And they were never in any shops you went in. Um, you know, there's only one real left-handed guitar shop in the country in Houston called Southpaw Guitars. And, um, so when, you know, when I was on tour, I would stop through there, but not all tours went through Houston, you know? So, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and he usually now just pretty much just carries the way higher end stuff. But, um, I did buy a guitar there on tour, an SG there on tour once. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so my thing kind of shifted from Gibson and Marshall to kind of all Fender as I joined the Aquabats. And um, uh, I still have my Les Paul. I just don't use it very often. And I kept the Marshall head I had. I had bought it in high school for like 300 bucks. It's a 77 JMP 100 watt. Oh, and it's the best sounding Marshall I've ever heard. And um, I, I've used it a little on in the studio. And now it kind of sits in my buddy Paul Miner's studio in Orange. He uses it on records there, but I just couldn't bring myself to sell it. It's the best deal I ever got on any piece of gear <laughs> ever. <laughs> that name. Um, oh, Paul produced some of the early Thrice records, right? Yeah. So he was the original bass player in Death by Stereo with me and which is, you know, my high school friend. And, mm-hmm. um, and he, right after high school, he was a couple years older than me. He started interning in, in, in studios and, and then started his own studio. So he has his own studio, Buzz Bomb Studios in Orange County. He's done a ton of stuff. He's done um, Newfound Glory, uh, yeah, Thrice, uh, some of the later Death by Stereo records. Um, I actually did the first one too. Um yeah, a lot of hardcore stuff, H2O, Agnostic Front, um, CJ Ramon, a couple of his records, ton of stuff. The guy's always, always working, always has cool bands. And he's, he's one of those guys, I love him. He's one of my best friends. He's, he's always like um, trying to perfect his craft. So, you know, I, I'll go in there and he's like, yeah, I'm just building my own mic prees right now. Like what? <laughs> he's like nice. bent over the bench, like, you know, soldering and, and stuff, just tr- always trying to improve. And that's, I love that about him. Yeah, as soon as you say, said his name, I was like, I know that name from somewhere. And I was like, oh yeah, like, it just clicked in my brain all of a sudden. Don't Usually I'm like, I can't remember that person's name. You know, he's the guy, he did the thing. Uh, but this was a different situation. Yeah, he was, you know, for a while, just kind of the go-to guy for Orange County Hardcore. He just, you know, was friends with all those bands and they just kind of all went to him to record and he did great. So, and he just so cool. keeps getting better. Yeah. So the left-handed thing I want to talk about a little bit. You, you touched on how, you know, difficult it is to find the guitars, but I've had a question and I've wanted to ask a left-handed player this question, mostly because I have kids and I don't know what handed they are yet. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've heard two schools of thought. I've heard like, if they are interested in playing guitar, make them learn right-handed, even if they're left-handed. And then I've heard because like, and the thought there being because guitar playing is not really a natural thing to do anyway, like it, it doesn't really matter. And then they'll yeah. have the you know bigger selection. Then I've heard the other school of thought of like, well, I mean, if they're not very comfortable playing that way it's going to be harder for them to learn so don't make them do that so i don't know what the answer is what is your opinion on it um well i've thought about it a lot and i think you just have to do what feels natural um because you know when i started i didn't think like oh well you know 25 years down the road you're going to be a professional musician you're going to have a real shortage of options like <laughs> right <laughs> I didn't think that. I just thought like, well, 
uh, this feels right to hold it this way, so I'm going to do it this way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. And so I, I think that's just what you should do, if anyone should do, and not worry about limited options. There's actually more options now as a left-handed player than there have ever been. Um, there's a lot of uh, companies that are offering a lot of lefty options, and you know, because of the internet and just kind of the gear explosion of the last decade, there's a you know a good market for used stuff too. So, um, you know, and if not, then you then you build it, yeah. You know, or or you um, or you flip it. You know, we've all every lefty has done that. You know, you just flip it over and flip the nut, flip the strings, and go for it. So, I mean. Yeah, it looks weird, but who knows? You know, maybe it feels right. So sometimes diff- it know, looks cool. It, and you know, there's different kinds of lefties because there's the lefties that'll play left-handed, but the strings will be opposite strung right-handed. You know, like um, Dick Dale was that way. Um, Chris from the Ataris was that way. And then, but there's I know there's a lot of people like who write left-handed who learn to play right-handed. Uh, like Billy Corrigan, some others. I, I, I don't know. I, I just say go with with what feels natural to you, because then you're more likely to enjoy and stick with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because like I'm not that good, and I I feel like if I had to go with, if I had to try to play left handed, uh, or would have been forced to, like I may not may not have stuck with it. That's always been my thought. Like I might not have. Yeah. It would have been, I'm already like struggling because I'm not naturally talented at the guitar. And then to add that on top of it, like I might have just quit. And that, that, that's no good. Everybody should just, that you, you're echoing what I've felt. I was at, just wanted to ask that question because it was like, well, man, it seems like that could force a kid out of playing accidentally, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And And I think there's probably a lot of lefties who were forced to play righties and, you know, maybe as they grew up, like, well, I'm glad I did that because now I have a lot of lot more guitars to choose from, and maybe it worked for them. But maybe, maybe they would have been better left-handed. Who knows? You know, there's no way of knowing all those what ifs. So, yeah, unless you just happen to be Michelangelo Badio and you can, right. you know, do, <laughs> right. do both. Like you, what, that you guy can, can do anything. Yeah, just do both. It's fine. And then, <laughs> and then, and then switch hands and do tapping cross cross your hands and do tapping on each neck while lifting it above your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had the speed kills VHS tape when I was a kid, man. I thought that was insane. <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, yeah, he might be coming on the podcast. I'm kind of excited about that, but. Oh, that's awesome. Is he going to do his little like Bugsy twenties accent like he did in the speed kills <laughs> video? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've never. Did you ever, ever, did you ever see a speed kills? His like instructional video. It looks like it was shot in a basement. Yes. 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 Yeah. I, I don't remember all of it, but I did watch that when I was younger. I think I watched it before I actually played, uh, my friend, oh, yeah, it's, just, it's just it's entertainment, you know. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, my friend uh, who I ended up playing in a band with for a long time. He he ended up being primarily a drummer. He's also a very talented guitar player. But his brother was a shredhead, and so yeah, we we watched all that stuff when we'd go over to their house. Just yeah. anything anything where you could play unreasonably fast. His brother was into it. So oh yeah, <laughs> of it, course. I remember it, I bought it through like a guitar ad in a guitar magazine or something, and it it came with the VHS and then like like twenty pages of photocopied like tabs of examples that he uses in the video because the video is I hate to say almost useless because it's like okay here's how here's the song <laughs> here's, here here is it half speed you know it's just. <laughs> okay so half speed is still 10 times faster than i'll ever be able to play it um okay i guess i'll just sit back and watch (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) it's a it's amazing that yeah that his half speed is you know it's so fast it's still so insanely fast i don't know he's inhuman that's all there oh yeah it's not it's nuts it's nuts Well, we're getting down to the last couple minutes of the show and what i usually like to do at this point is let you plug something or if you have something you want to get off your chest you know whatever you got to do <laughs> now is the now is the time to do it oh um well i'll just say if, uh, if you want to check out the new aquabats record it comes out um august 21st 
and uh, just aquabats.com have all the all the info on it first first studio record in nine years so pretty exciting yeah where can so people find you um yeah i'm just on instagram and i'm not well i'm on twitter but i don't use it that much but instagram my handle is just ian w fowls so check me out there there you go easy all yeah. right here we go with the classic questions to wrap the show up first one what is your favorite boss pedal super overdrive Ooh, right there with it oh yeah super- it was my first pedal i ever had and it's still my favorite pedal of all time i think so well there you go that's easy yeah we didn't even get into pedals how shame on me shame on me <laughs> i'm really letting the people down over here boss super overdrive all right that's a good one yep. that's solid how about you my oh my favorite boss pedal yeah right now i mean i keep going back and forth and i have a few that i need to pick up based on people's recommendations but some i waffle back and forth between the bf2 i have an old uh black knob bf2 that i really like mm-hmm. yeah, and that's great the this is gonna be kind of weird but i love the ds1 i love it mm-hmm. i think it sounds yeah. awesome and it sounds yeah. awesome on baritone people don't know this people don't talk about it the ds1 sounds killer on a baritone guitar i'd posted a video probably a year ago now on instagram it was like guess what pedal this is and everyone's like i don't know it's this it's that it's that i'm like psych it's a ds1 and it just sounded enormous like yeah i have a ds1 i love i think it was 30 or 40 bucks and then my buddy paul miner did a mod on it for me and it's awesome sounds like a almost like a jcm 800 or something it's crazy yes ds1 so right now i'm gonna go with the ds1 because i'm looking at my black one and i really like it so there we go that's what i'm gonna say right on that might change when i get a ps3 the ps3 seems like all kinds of my business but i have not played one yet so i can't i will reserve judgment until then (laughs) okay but the last question and this is the one that gets everybody in trouble What's your favorite kind of pizza? Are we talking like brand? Can be brand, can be, you know, maybe you've got a spot that you really like somewhere in the country or in the world, or maybe maybe you make one at home. It can be anything. Like, what is your favorite pizza? Hmm. Well, that, this is a tough one because... For me, pizza, there's no such thing as bad pizza. It's like it's like a sliding scale, you know? There's only good to best for me. I'll, I'll eat it all. But I will say I do like um, the like four cheese Neapolitan style, that thin crust kind of Italian mm-hmm. with kind of the globs of, of the cheese on it and stuff. I, I think that's probably my favorite. That sounds real nice. That sounds really yeah. good. How about you? You know, I I used to think that the New York pizza thing was all hype. You know, I, I live here in Portland. I was just like, it, you know, it, it looks it looks good. It looks like good, decent pizza, but like, what's the deal? After traveling there and eating it, I'm like, oh, because I was I was skeptical. I was like, this isn't going to be that much better. But I really like a good new york slice i'm a big fan of it i also like the italian like wood-fired you know yeah kind of yuppie pizza i i we have a really good spot in town that i love that that does a great job with that portland is secretly a really great town for pizza it really is nice we've got some (laughs) we've got some legit spots and i don't uh, think i've ever eaten pizza in portland well i so (laughs) it's kind of funny because i have Brian Fallon was in town like a year and a half or so ago, maybe two years. And, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, let's I got to take you to the Benson Amp shop and take you to a couple of different places. And uh, he was we were talking about pizza. And he's, I was like, well, we do have good pizza. And, you know, he's from New Jersey. They got pretty quality pizza there as well. Yeah. And he was a little skeptical. But I took him to a spot and uh, he was very pleasantly surprised. He was like, wow, you guys do have good pizza here in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say maybe the best pizza I ever had was in New York City um, at John's on Bleecker Street. Oh, yeah, man. That place is bomb. I love that place. That might have been the best pizza I've ever had. 
that place been is there really three times because that place is amazing. I like John's a lot. That that one's great. I also like one that's not too far away is Joe's on Carmine Street. Um, I don't think I've eaten there. Yeah, it's it's one of those really iconic ones. I think it was the one in the Spider Man movie. Uh, oh, uh-huh. and yeah, it's super good. But yeah, John's on Bleecker is legit. Yeah, so good. And then I did live in Chicago a little when I was a little kid for a little bit, and that. Um, Gino's East in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different thing, right? But it's pretty great. I need to get to Chicago. I really need to get there. It's like one slice is a a meal almost, you know, because it's that deep dish, you know, three inches deep. (laughs) (laughs) Take, take, takes 45 minutes to cook kind of thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's delicious. Man, now I'm hungry. Yeah. What am I going to have for lunch? Probably some pizza. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. I mean, and Aqu- the Aquabats have a song called Pizza Day, right? So oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We, I guess we should be connoisseurs of pizza. You should be. Should be. Well, if you ever find yourself uh, here in town and, you know, things aren't crazy anymore, I'll, I'll take you to some spots. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. Yeah, right on, man. Well, thanks so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. Dude, this was great. Um, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. So for Ian, this is Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. All right, there you go. There you have it, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. I hope you dig all the episodes. I truly, truly do. I really enjoy giving them to you. And we're going to keep doing it. And if you need additional content, there's even more over on Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash tone mob. And for as little as $5 a month, you can get fresh episodes to your ears every week in addition to the main episodes. Oh yeah, I know I've said this for months and months, but currently the patrons are paying my electric bills. And so I thank you very much if you're a patron of the show. In fact, we just crested over the point where the patrons are paying for my electric bills and a coffee, about a coffee every month. My electric bills are officially A thing of the past, thanks to the patrons. But hey, it's not just a freebie handout thing that we're looking for there. You get extra content delivered to your ears, your ears, your ears, every week, including this week, where I go deep with Ian on some alien stuff. We talk about, (laughs) yeah, we talk about aliens. We talk about aliens and extraterrestrials for about 40 minutes because it's a thing we're both very interested in, whether or not I believe it. Is another story, but it's still interesting. But it was really fun. We talked for about 40 minutes about crazy things, and in the last 20 or so, we talked about guitar stuff. Oh, yeah, we actually talked about guitar stuff. That is important. So, patreon.com slash tone mob for all of that. Thank you so much for downloading this. Thank you so much for listening to this point. I can't tell you how much that means, especially in this crazy world that we're in right now. And I'm going to sign off and go... Uh, Have a little pre-birthday celebration to round out the day. And again, if you're listening to this on the day the episode drops, it's my birthday. And the best birthday present you could give me is hollering at me somehow and sharing this episode with your friends. All right. Take care of yourselves out there. I know things are crazy. Love you all. Later. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, That will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com slash StringJoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is tonemob.com stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? 
Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstory as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gun Street harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunStreetWiringShop.com and check them out.